Oh, it's a pig! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Lake Erie Kayak Anglers Podcast, the podcast designed to make you a better angler. I'm Chuck Earls from LakeErieKayakFishing.com, and today I have a very special episode for you today. I have Jerry Godeg on. He is a Cleveland native. 28 years ago, he was lost out on Lake Erie for over 80 hours before they rescued him over on the other side of the border. How you doing today, Jerry? Doing great. Happy to be here. Hey, man. Thanks for joining me. So I consider this story one of the most valuable stories I've learned along the way. Um, and one of the reasons that I have such an immense respect for Mother Erie, because if you're not careful, uh, she will scold you. So I just wanted to bring you on the podcast, share this story. It's, it's a very magical story. Um, very important. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, over the 28 years, I've told that several parties and stuff, and people are really intrigued by it. Um, you know, it's a story by the time we're done, you're going to see, you meet every emotion, emotions you didn't even have. Um, now, obviously, today with modern technology that we didn't have back then, hopefully this will never happen to somebody. But if it does, you know. Well, you know, that's that's what we're here trying to prevent, you know. Um, it's not that people don't want to be safe. They just, most of the time, we don't know any better until it's too late or we learn. Um, and that's why we're doing this podcast today. So, uh, well, let's start out. Tell me a little bit about that Thursday, um, maybe like an hour before work. What was the preparations? What was the mood? And, well, uh, and what was the plan? So this, this happened 28 years ago. Correct. You were 25 years old? Correct. All right. And uh, what kind of experience did you have as a boater at that point? Actually, I, did, I mean, believe it or not, that much. Not that much. I mean, uh, you know, I grew up 12, 12, 15 minutes from Lake Erie. At that point, we would go down to uh, Avon Lake, run a boat, about a 16-foot aluminum. You had your Erie Dairies, Hot and Tots uh, for trolling back then. You know, I knew Avon Point. I knew Lorraine. Um, I did know uh, the sandbar between Vermilion and Lorraine, but didn't know anything about the islands. And this was a great opportunity for me. A good friend of mine asked me to fish a tournament with him in Putin Bay in April, um, which is the same time the Pro-Am was. Now, we obviously weren't pros and fishing the Pro-Am, but very exciting time to be there and fish in this a tournament at the same time. Um, so Thursday, we all worked together. We were very excited. As soon as we got off, which was nine o'clock at night, uh, we drove to the Vermilion River where he had his boat and marina there. Basically, they had everything ready, our favorite rods, favorite bait, favorite hot and tots, and Jack Daniels and beer on our way to put in bay. Well, about halfway there, I was driving his boat. We didn't have a Loran system. There was no GPS back then. And he said, you want to drive? I said, absolutely. So I was driving his boat, um, safe boat, by, by you know, all means, a safe boat, Deep V Hall, Wellcraft. And about halfway there, we had this, back then we had these things called bag phones. And he had the bag phone sitting next to the compass plugged into the lighter. At that point, when the phone began to ring, I wasn't paying much attention. When he answered the phone, and I looked down momentarily, a compass went into a free spin. So you had basically what was a, like a satellite phone? Uh, not, I mean, back then I wouldn't call it that. You know, that was when cell phones first came out. I mean, it was huge. You know, it's sat. Oh, you know, yeah. And I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Later on, I guess we found out that phone also ran on some type of magnetism. Gotcha. But you know, that's one thing, uh, one important thing to consider as a boater is a lot of times there's specific electronics that put off a, a certain frequency, which is going to interfere with your fish finder or your, your navigation system. Or, or in this case, you know, in Jerry's case, um, that bag phone interfered with the compass. Yes. So at that point, I had pulled the throttle back to neutral. He hung up with his wife. And, and uh, 
at that point, we didn't know what to do. I actually made a phone call to a very good friend of mine uh, who pretty much grew up on the Vermilion River. Uh, as far as I know, probably still lives on the Vermilion River. And we had an overcast coming in. And he had told us at that point that we probably shouldn't continue to the islands and possibly at that point anchor. Because at that point, we were halfway there and we were couldn't see land. So, you know, I believe that's about six, seven miles out. Now, in those weather conditions, you know, probably couldn't see even that far. But it was seasonally warm for April, which we thought was a good thing, which you'll find out in the story turned out not to be such a good thing. Well, the captain, um, he said, hey, I've made this run a thousand times. Boat's facing this way. Let's go. So when I say a half hour, 40 minutes is all we were away. He, of course, was driving the boat. Next thing I know, I looked down at my watch and we had ran about an hour and 15 minutes. So I, North. well, we don't know what, we don't know what direction we're going. So at that point, you know, I get his attention, slows the boat down. I said, you know, hey, man, we've been, we've been running, man, over an hour. So the intended direction was north. No, though, right? Well, northwest, yeah. Okay. Um, so he decided, let's turn left, right? Let's turn left. So let's look at this map real quick. Let's, uh, so where's the Vermilion River from here? There's the Vermilion River. Right. And then the islands are up here. Right. So we're heading northwest. So at that point, once we realized we had definitely passed Putin Bay, and we thought we were going west-northwest, he decided to take a left. So we took a left. At that point, wind started to pick up and light rain started. So we drove and we drove and we drove for probably another two, three hours. And even at that point, and it's so dark out there, you have an overcast, the water's picking up. Now, when we left, it was one foot. Now it's starting to pick up. Panic starts to set in. You start to get cold. Well, we continued to keep driving to about three or four in the morning. And guess what? We were out of gas. At that point, we get on the ship to shore radio. Nobody's answering us. We actually used the bag phone to call the Marblehead Coast Guard. We explained to them what happened, explained to them basically the direction we were going. They asked a lot of questions. Told us to sit tight. They'll come look for us in the morning. And it was, what was the conditions? It was bad. It was about three to four footers. It was a somewhat of a mist to light rain, which kind of helped us. You know, give you an idea, we would take turns going down in the cuddy to warm up. And you this know, was a 19-foot uh, deep V Wellscraft. Wellcraft, yeah. With a cuddy? Yep. I had, you know, times are different back then. You know, I didn't have the guide gear and stuff I have now. I had, you know, a couple pairs of jeans, a couple pairs of long underwear, a couple of hoodies, and a wool high school jacket because it was wool. Well, it? anybody that knows wool, it's not rain resistant. <laughs> What was the temperatures? Point. At that point, believe it or not, it, o- it only dropped at night to about uh, mid-40s, which, again, is somewhat seasonably warm for April. You, do you remember what the water temperature was? Oh, it was low 40s. So the next morning, we think it would, you know, by daylight, we could not see. It was fog everywhere because, once again, it was 50-some degrees, pushing 60 and the water was cold. Well, out of nowhere comes an iron ore boat, which in a 19-foot wild craft, you have no idea how big an iron ore boat when it comes. And let me just back up for a second. None of us have slept. You you were scared. You know, you got a boat with no power. Luckily, the battery was still holding up. Um, this iron ore boat was beyond uncomfortably safe how close it was. At the back of it, we didn't see anybody standing on it or anything. It's probably, you know, very early in the morning. We see Canada flags. 
So we immediately get on the phone, call Marblehead Coast Guard. They make a call to Canada Coast Guard. Then, believe it or not, we could hear them on the station they told us to go to. We could hear them talking to the Canada Coast Guard. The Canada, Co Canada Coast Guard said, with this fog, well, first they came back and said, no iron ore boat saw us. And believe it or not, we were, you know, what? Not even 12 hours in, we were already panicked. Not one of us wrote down their numbers on the side of the ship, you know. All we saw was the Canada flag. So we can hear Canada say they're not going to come look for us because the fog's so thick. Well, Marblehead sends out a cutty. Well, what would you say uh, the visibility was? Oh, man, it was bad. Quarter mile, maybe off the bow. Quarter mile. Maybe, maybe, you know. It was bad. And this was uh, probably, what, the morning of the first day, right? Yeah, morning of the first day. When was the last time you ate? At this point, we hadn't, we hadn't eaten, and we weren't drinking the beer or the Jack Daniels either. And you didn't have any water? We had no water. We did have ice cubes. Um, but, you know, again, you know, fear setting in, cold setting in, even though, like, it got warmer, you know, during the day. Man, you, you weren't looking forward to the next night, I could tell you that. Um, so, Marblehead sends out a cutter. Um, he kind of knows what route we, he, we thought we took, you know, and we're talking to him. Oh, first day, eventually, fog starts to set in, starts to get towards evening. They call off the search. What was crazy is we couldn't talk to the Marblehead Coast Guard on the ship to shore radio, but we could hear them talking to the cutter captain. So they basically told us when we knew they were turning around, canceling the search for the night, I guess you could say. They told us, hey, you know, you're in a good area um, and we should anchor, but anchor with as much line as we can because we're coming into, you know, first of all, it's three to fours all day and we're coming now into three to fives for the night. Okay. But they said, you know, Anchor with as much rope as you can. And they said, you're the great, you came here to fish. You're the great fishery. Drop a line. Well, so let me, go ahead. let me ask you, what were, what was the feeling when the Coast Guard said, hey, we're, we're calling it off for the night. Anchor down. Just be careful. What were the, what were the thoughts going through your head? Well, I mean, I, you know, obviously I was really bummed. That we're going to spend another night, you know, um, at this point we started to like suck the ice cubes for water that didn't last long. Um, I was starting to get really scared, starting to get really scared. Like this was real, you know, this was real. I mean, the captain started to get both the gentlemen I was with were much older than me, uh, 31, 32. I shouldn't say much older than me, way more experienced than me. Um, both of them knew the islands, you know, that's why it was going to be exciting to fish the tournament with them. And they were starting to get scared. You know, when you see older guys like that get scared, it tends to uh, make you a little, even a little bit more scared. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's that's a that's a situation that really kind of opens your eyes to a lot of things. Um, and one thing that I wanted to point out was the one of the last things that the uh, the the cutty captain had said to you was, "Hey, you're in great no. fishing." Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You're right one of the last things that he had said to you was, Hey, you're in great fishing waters, drop a line, try to catch some fish, you know? And the, the, the thing about that is a lot of it's a mental game, right? You know, because if you stay focused, you keep your mind off of that. You just keep pushing forward, you know, you'll make it to the morning. Right. Um, instead of maybe jumping off and trying to swim the shore. But it wasn't an I, option in April, right? You know, it wasn't an option. We're going to get there because it really yeah. wasn't an option. 11 minutes, you know, and you die of hypothermia at that point. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's if you make it through the maximum intensity cold shock. And, the, right. you know, if you got a PFD on and you get through the, uh, um, you know, your, your um, involuntary gas reflex when you hit the water, that's sketchy stuff. But continue. So, obviously, we did not at all sleep again Friday night. We did not cast the line. Panic really started to set in. So here we come up on Saturday morning. And again, we got fog as thick as I've ever seen on Lake Erie. Um, and again, your, you know, your mind starts to play tricks on you. Well, believe it or not, and this is for sure. And I, you know, we'll get there, but you know, I've been boating on Lake Erie for a long time. I've never seen anything like this. When the lights came on, 
we seen an object in the water, almost looked like a water tower, but upside down. At this point, I was trying to explain that on the phone to the uh, Coast Guard, and they literally asked me if I was on drugs. I said, no, I am not on drugs. I can assure you of that. I haven't slept in you know a couple of days, but I am not on drugs, sir. Let me, let me ask you, at that point, when was the last time you had any water? Oh, it'd been over 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Over and before hours. that, it was just what a couple of ice cubes. Ice cubes. Yeah. We and rationed maybe. them off, you know, but I didn't touch the beer of the Jack Daniels. You, you know, I don't know. Maybe somebody else would have. I, you know, my, my father was a Navy man, did three tours of Vietnam. He always taught us to pay attention, to focus, you know, um, made our minds strong, you know. So even though I was scared being a young guy, I didn't really want them, I guess, to know, you know, like, but I could see the panic in them. And, you know, I'm sure they could see the panic in me. So now it's Saturday morning. We tell him this. Cutter Captain has no idea. He's like, there's just, you know, I don't know what that is either, what he's seeing, you know. So they started having us me count down on, on the uh, ship to shore radio from 100 all the way down to one and then back up. And what they're trying to do is pick us up on radar. Well, again, you know, the three to fives turned into four to fives. The mist rain never stopped. And we were having trouble holding anchor. So again, you know, I'm counting from one to the one, one thousand, two, all the way up and all the way back down the whole day. At one point, though, I'll never forget this. We got so excited because the one gentleman that was with us said he's seen the Coast Guard helicopter. So I immediately got, caught, got in the bag phone, called him up. I said, hey, you know, hey, we see the helicopter. And you have no idea what it took it out of us when they said, we don't have a helicopter. <laughs> um, oh, so at this point, we're going, you know, we're, we're going into another night, you know, and they start talking about the fog and how they, you know. So again, we can't talk to them on the ship to shore radio, but we can hear them talking. So Marblehead Coast Guard sent, says to the cutter, Let's turn around. We'll give it another shot tomorrow. And the cutter captain says, I think I know where they're at, but they're in a heavy reef area and they probably will not make it through the night. Now you want to talk about panic set, man. And you want to talk about being scared. You're already cold. You're already hungry and probably dehydrated at this point, even though it's raining, you know, you know, it's, but it's going through your mind. And, and again, you haven't slept in how many days? I mean, fear, talk about fear. So, it wasn't until about nine or 10 that evening. I literally on that cell phone called my father and mother and gave my last rites. The captain called and gave his wife his last rites. And then my other buddy called same thing, you know, like we did not think we were going to make it through. So here we come Sunday morning. Starts to light up fog starts to burn off. And we see what we think is an Island. In my estimate, it's about 100 yards long, which now I would say with my experience, it was a shoal covered in birds. Not the captain, but the other gentleman is ready to swim ashore. He's going to eat the eggs when he gets there, okay? This gentleman's a ninth degree black belt. I was stunned that he was really literally getting ready to jump into the water. And I said, are you out of your mind? Like, you're, there's no wood. You can't, you need the eggs. How are you going to get yourself warm again, you know? And this was... Day three. This is Sunday morning. Sunday morning. So it had been a couple of days, no water, no food, no sleep. No sleep. I mean, thank God you guys had the, the cutty to get down in and warm up a little bit. I mean, if not, you you might have, you know, succumbed to hypothermia and, and not have made it. But I can't imagine no sleep, no food, no water. You got to be seeing some crazy things. Well, like I said, when we first seen this island, quote, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie. At one point, though, you know, if anything happens, you know, we'll go there. But I'm thinking to myself, besides the birds, you know. So once again, I call Coast Guard. The cutter is already on, out looking for us. And we start again counting from one to one, one to 100 and back. The fog was probably the worst that morning that I had ever seen the whole weekend. Crazy things, you know. I mean, 
we were literally emotionally breaking down. Did the you cutter remember? captain, the cutter captain comes on and says, I think I know where they're at. Within about 45 minutes, I couldn't see him, but I could hear a siren. And the cutter captain said, cutter captain, excuse me, said, we got you. We've got you. And you talk about one of the greatest feelings I've ever felt in my life. Uh, Three men hugging, truly excited. It was just absolutely crazy. And I'll never forget when the cutter captain pulled up, captain of this boat, my other buddy, immediately jumped on that cutter. We're welcomed with blankets. We were so excited. And I'll never forget it. The cutter captain came out, looked down at me and said, let me guess, you're Jerry. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, I don't think any bad news, and I'm looking at you, you know. And he said, well, good news is you're saved. The bad news is, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you at the helm and steer on the way back as we told you. I said, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, again, you know, just pure excitement. We're saved. I mean, at that point, I don't think I was even tired, you know. They told us in a put in bay, put us up to the gas dock. You know, we thanked them. I mean, Jesus, man, what those guys do. You know, utmost respect for them, utmost respect for them. And they didn't want to give up. You know, they didn't want to give up. I think those guys, if they could have, if they were allowed, they would have looked for us all night. You know, I mean, you know, I was pretty impressed by all of that. The men and women that are in the, the U.S. Coast Guard, you know, they they give their own lives and risk their own lives to come out and save, you know, uh, people in need. Um, definitely want to take a minute and just thank them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I cannot give them enough credit kudos i mean oh my god they saved my life all of our lives you know so the funny part about it is you know the tournaments are over but putting base packed we go into frosties because we haven't eaten and we are literally standing in line rocking because we've been on the water in a 19 foot boat in three to fives and people started to realize who we were I'll never forget it. People asked us, they said, hey, are you the guys that have been lost for the last three days? And we said, yes, we are. How'd you know? At this point, I still didn't know I was rocking. You know, it was pretty crazy. You know, I mean, they hugged us. They bought us food. We, you know, here they had listened to us all weekend and rooting for us, you know, rooting for the Coast Guard to find us. You know, it was, uh, I'll tell you what. One of the craziest experiences ever in my life. Emotions I got to know that I didn't even know I had. And so thankful for my father to maybe who the man I am to keep my cool and pull through that, you know. You know, speaking of that, um, there are many, many of the ways that I prepare on Lake Erie, um, you know, that come from what I see is a foundation that I've learned from you and, and the stories that you've told me and, and the lessons that you've taught me about preparing out there. Um, you know, so I just want to say thank you for that. You know, thank you for the guidance and, um, you know, being willing to share this story, not only just with me, but, but now with the world, um, you know, it, it may save a life one day. It may change a perspective at the end of the day, you know, it's not because people don't want to be safe. Um, most, sometimes, most of the time we just don't know any better. So, yeah, I mean that, you know, that was not something anybody expected. Like I said, it was pure excitement on the way there. I mean, I mean, it was magical and boy, it turned ugly quick. And, you know, again, with modern technology, hope, hopefully nobody will ever have to experience something like that. Um, but I mean, things can happen. You lose electrical, you know, anything can happen out there. And, you know, we all know Lake Erie is nothing to mess with. Well, here's the thing, man. You know, I am a, I'm a Lake Erie kayak angler and we don't have all these electronics and navigation systems and, and low ramps that the big boats have. Right. Um, so this is something that I look at is still a very real possibility for us, especially somebody under human power that maybe is not paying attention to the wind. Um, and they get caught in a bad situation and they can't make it back because I've, I've dealt with some wins 
especially early on in the pungo where the wind was so strong i had to actually shift my direction just to get enough gap ground because the wind was basically making me just hold position but you hit the nail on the head right there you said you knew how to shift position to get where you needed to go and that's the real important stuff that people need to know in case they are, are ever in a situation like this you know absolutely you know and the other thing they had this thing called a it's a personal locator beacon so the cool thing about a personal locator beacon is it's better than a vhf radio um, which vhf radio works off a line of sight well a personal locator beacon when you hit the button and you're di in distress it sends your GPS coordinates up to the satellites and then back down to yeah, the rescue and authorities. Huge. Um, you know, really, really great product. I think they're like $350, $369, but it's an insurance policy. You can use it on and off the water, and it's going to make sure that you get home, especially for us kayak anglers or for small boaters, somebody that doesn't have the, the navigation and low ranch systems and all that. Um, actually, Fish USA just brought it on. Um, you know, as a uh, as a request for me, so head over, check it out at Fish USA. It's the ACR Rescue Link Personal Locator Beacon. Check that out. Yeah, something like that for sure will save your life. That's for sure. You know, yeah, take advantage of the modern technology out there because you just never know. Well, think about it, Jerry. With that, if you had one of those and you hit that, they would have known exactly where you were. Absolutely, you, know, and you wouldn't have had to spend a couple of days. But I don't know if they had those back then probably didn't they did, man they probably didn't it was and if probably they did pretty pricey yeah you know and that you know that's a big thing you know so the amazing thing is i tell everybody the story it's crazy because two years later i bought my first boat on lake erie and spent 20 years fished most of the great lakes with that boat and but i had a loran system backup battery backup spark plugs backup wires i was never going to let that happen to me again and i wish i could tell you it never did. I never did get lost, but I've got caught in a couple of storms because I didn't want to leave because we were either smashing the walleye or smashing the steelhead 12 miles out. And, you know, that's Lake Erie's nothing to mess with. So just respect her. And, uh, you know, I share my story just because anything can happen, you know, anything can happen on the water, you know, yep. anything can happen and just, you know, be prepared for it. And, you know, God bless the modern technology today because more than likely you're not going to have to spend three or four days out there. Exactly. We pretty much uh, covered everything I, I had. Now, one thing I did want to touch on, Jerry, is after everything happened, and you kind of went into it a little bit at the end, um, most people will take a situation like that, and they'll never get back on big water, um, or any water for that matter. But you took a situation like that, and you bought a boat two years later, and you took that experience learned from it and prepared for it with backup and redundancies everywhere. Absolutely. You know, and I'm so glad I did it. You know, I don't know. It's just, uh, I never really blame Lake Erie, you know, it was our own fault. You know, I mean, not, I'm not blaming the captain on who would have known, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and maybe it was a blessing, but she allowed us to live, you know? So I look at it that way too. And, you know, I, my love for fishing was, you know, really starting to get going. And I'm so glad that, you know, I got to experience it. You know, um, I ended up going all over the country, all over the world fishing. You know, I got to experience saltwater. You know, it's uh, something I think that obviously it's my passion. So, you know, it's something that has defined me. Um, and you know that, you know, we've all heard the saying or the song, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And maybe in this situation, that's exactly what happened. You know, exactly what happened. I mean, not just you. Um, I owe a lot of my preparations to you. You know, you're definitely one of my big water mentors, and uh, I've learned a ton along the way. So, you know, Lake Erie didn't just teach you that day, but, you know, she also taught you, which taught me, which now is teaching everybody that's listening to this podcast. So everything happens for a reason. Like you said, she let you live and, uh, you know, tell everybody, share your story. Yeah, so, you know, an immense amount of respect. And, you know, what a great place to grow up, you know, on the shores of Lake Erie with the fabulous rivers we have here and got to experience it all. I started at a very young age chasing bass and, you know, turned to steelhead, walleye, salmon. Never forget it. Never forget it. If there was one 
tactic, one fishing technique, one secret that you've learned over the years, doesn't matter what fishery, one thing that stands out to you that really revolutionized you as an evolving angler, what would it be? You've been fishing say, for hey, over... For those of you that like to troll out there, nothing better than a neutral drop at the right time. Yeah. Nothing better to get them going, a neutral drop at the right time. Right. All right. So um, I just want to leave you guys with this. Our life is not our own. It belongs to our family, friends, and loved ones. We owe it to them to always focus on safety and to do everything in our power to return back home to them. It's optional to go out, but it's mandatory to make it back. Fishing is life, but safety comes first. Jerry, I just want to thank you for joining me on the podcast today, sharing this powerful story um, and and extremely valuable lesson with our listeners and, uh, you know, sharing it with me and having a big uh, impact in, in my growth and preparation and being safe out there. Uh, especially as a Lake Erie kayak angler. So, well, you know, I thanks was, for coming on the show, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, you know, very happy to be here. Happy to share the story and, you know, happy to give back too, because I had some great mentors. So thank you very much for having me. Thanks, brother. All right. Appreciate you, man. Tight lines, everybody. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the show. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. We will see you on the next episode. And remember, for me, fishing is life.